David, it is great to see you. It's been a hard year for all of us, but uh, I've been reflecting on the, the 20 years that we have uh, interacted and what has happened. And we're very excited that uh, you can be with us for our first live Closer to Truth chat, which will be both live and into perpetuity. Uh, you're a scientist, science fiction writer, futurist, visionary, all of those things. You know, Closer to Truth is about the big questions of cosmos, consciousness, meaning, the nature of existence and the place of human sentience in it. But uh, today, humanity is confronted with serious global problems, challenges from geopolitical conflict to planetary existential risk. We all know about it. So I'd like to start because you personify the overlap between existence and existential risk. So let's look for a kind of a near term assessment. And I'm going to start in the negative because that's the way we all feel today. So what worries you today? Well, uh, the, the, the same things that are in the news, of course. Um, uh, for context, for those tuning in uh, in the 22nd century, we just finished 2020, which a lot of um, people have called the worst year they ever saw. And of course, some of us remember the stories of folks who had to go through the depression of World War II. Robert, you and I went through 1968, and we know that any two weeks from that year would have broken any of these snowflakes. <laughs> but never mind, it was a terrible year. It was a difficult year. Uh, a lot of science fiction things came true, um, uh, pandemics, though not as bad as some of the ones we in science fiction have talked about. And of course, uh, the kind of political and social fracturing Robert Heinlein predicted, George Orwell, uh, whether or not this great experiment of ours in um, a civilization that not only does freedom and democracy, those quickly become platitudes, uh, but reciprocal accountability, the ability of people to laterally hold each other accountable with transparency and light and information that flows in all directions and on all types of elites. Um, that's the purpose of my book, The Transparent Society, and it's been a focus of speculative events in a great many of my novels. So uh, I, I, again and again, we come back to this same theme of mine that very few of our problems would not be improved um, or ameliorated by judicious and even handed applications of light. So can we, focus on a critical element that has uh, that, that affects us both nationally and geopolitically, and that is the nature of truth. And it's not a coincidence that we, on Closer to Truth, talk about that. Now, we do it generally in, a, in, a, in an existential, metaphysical, philosophical sense, but it really hits us very strongly in several ways. Uh, we all hear about the fake media. We all hear, you know, the famous line, you're in entitled to your own opinion, but not entitled to your own facts. We see various countries in the world of clamping down on, on freedom of information, more so now than maybe people thought about it. So is that a good way to think about what is happening now in terms of the nature of truth? Oh, I think absolutely, um, which is an odd way for me to respond because truth is not absolute. We live in the subjective realities. Plato said this, Socrates said it, Jesus said it, Buddha said it. They all said the same thing. Our senses are corrupted. We are inherently delusional. And this is the central fact about humans. It, it is not just a bad thing. Our ability to craft magnificent delusions is a source of great art. It's a source of our imagining that things could be different than they are and therefore worth our ambitious effort and cooperative and competitive efforts to make things better. But the fundamental that Jesus, Socrates, Buddha, they all said was that uh, we are inherently delusional and our models of the world are not totally accurate. But then they did something that pervaded almost all look backward cultures. And that was to say, People in the past had a golden age, they knew better, give up on trying to surpass that. Um, we have an arrogance that was taught to us in the Renaissance and it's gradually clawed its way upward 
to the notion that, yes, our senses are flawed. We will never perfectly see objective reality, though, you know, I, I, that's a topic that I talk about all the time in many of my science fiction stories and novels, how people might approach it from this angle or that angle or technology. But as Galileo taught and we figured out over the years, we can find out what something is not. We can carve away untruths. The, the effort to find out what is capital T true, as Jacob Bronowski pointed out in the final episode of The Ascent of Man, is fraught with possibilities for great crime because people get confident that they know that what this truth is and hold in utter contempt those who can supply to them the one thing that gets us toward lower T truth, that moves lower T truth forward and forward and forward and forward, and that is criticism. Cito Kate, criticism is the only known ant antidote to error. And that's what science is about. Those of us who were raised in science, uh, I don't use my PhD or my scientific credentials much anymore, though I'm involved with NASA and some research, types of research because civilization pays me more for my fantasies and my, and my thought experiments than it used to pay me to be a, a, a scientist. But I was raised in the sacred catechism of science, which is, I might be wrong. And because they are raised in that catechism, scientists get techniques to eliminate maybe half of their delusions. That's fantastic. But the other half can only be solved by criticism because the scientists themselves are delusional. And that's what our Enlightenment society has been all about. That's what the Constitution of the United States, divided powers, uh, open markets of ideas, that's what they're all about. Enabling like, people to hold each other accountable reciprocally. I like the idea of truth as present progressive. Uh, many people who write to Closer to Truth call it Closer to the Truth. And I have to tell you an inside story that when the first uh, 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 season began in the year 1999 it was planned and broadcast in 2000 the PBS station we worked with wanted to call it closer to the truth because he, they said the audience will want the truth and I said I am completely flexible to anything about what we're developing except that one word the I will not do this program if I have to use the word the full stop full stop <laughs> absolutely <laughs> <laughs> completely right. And, and that shows what, what astonishes me is that a majority of our fellow citizens in this primitive, primitive era, and we will be called primitive, um, hopefully, ideally, by our descendants, it looks as if a majority of our citizens not only understand this general notion of reciprocal accountability, but the other great idea of the Enlightenment, which is the positive sum game. The notion that throughout the last 6,000 years, the rule was I can get, I can advance and win by making others lose. And that's the way it is in nature. Sure. And there's no reason why we should have evolved the capability of actually grokking, understanding this thing that's pushed in most Hollywood movies is the notion I can win by helping everyone else to win, but I win a little more. <laughs> uh, you talk about something called a fact act, which uh, you have proposed, uh, one might think half in jest because the likelihood of passing that is low, uh, but it is, it is an important um, uh, mechanism to, to make your point. And you, you call it pushing back against idiocracy, if I pronounce that properly. <laughs> you should see that movie. It, it's actually quite charming. Um, the the um, California Democratic Party, a couple of years ago, asked me to, for their convention, to concoct a near future science fictional piece of legislation. And I believed then, as I do now, that the biggest problem we face is that the notion of fact has been terribly undermined. Um, it is now a relentless campaign by one of our political wings to demean and disparage 
all fact using professions and all fact checking services. And they aren't entirely alone because the other political wing does have an extreme element that um, in its academic poses and things like that, uh, disparages the notion of objective reality, reciprocal accountability, in fact. Now, when concocting this piece of legislation that might help us get out of this, because I believe our enemies have been concocting this notion of getting the most pragmatic and scientific people in the history of our species, a large minority of them to reject any of the systematic methods we've had for finding out what's lowercase true. And I realized that if you set up any sort of a fact checking service, governmental or anything like that, the instant response will be, this is an Orwellian attempt to set up a ministry of truth. Now, this is actually a good thing done by science fiction. The greatest science fiction stories are self-preventing prophecies, and the greatest of them all, uh, Soylent Green recruited environmentalists, uh, Terminator made us re-inspect uh, AI, War Games made us, uh, helped us to, uh, and Dr. Strangelove helped us to evade um, nuclear war, but Orwell's 1984 was the greatest self-preventing prophecy, and it tuned all Americans, especially, to think that their enemies are trying to set up Big Brother. And the irony being, of course, that if we just paid attention to each other, we'd realize that all elites are dangerous. But put that aside. This ministry of truth thing can be, has been used against all of our immune systems against lies. So what I tried to come up in the FACT Act, and I'm sure that, uh, that uh, you folks can find it by putting in my name and fact act online was it has to have the appearance of being competitive and then people will say it's lateral it's not being imposed from above either by a government or by experts because we all know experts can be wrong uh, unfortunately the mantra now is all experts are wrong we so the FACT Act starts by reversing some of the uh, calumnies of recent years, reset up the Office of Technology Assessment in Congress and the Office of Science and Technology Policy, reestablish the rebuttal rule so that one minute per hour of ranting on the various shock jock networks will go to re rebutters. And, and I believe that one minute per hour mm -hmm. of screaming would demolish most of these uh, treason uh, networks. Uh, whistleblower rules, uh, I, I believe that there's a tsunami of blackmail in Washington, DC. But um, I think the cleverest part of the FACT Act would be simply this. All senators and representatives are required to choose two people from their home district to serve as advisors on, on, on scientific fact and on um, st st statistics. And it doesn't matter. They can be as far to the right as they are. They can be as far to the left as the representative is. No attempt to impose anything. But if you refuse to have these advisors to speak for you, because this would eliminate the whole, I'm not a scientist. Somebody in your office will have to answer about climate change. Somebody in your office will have to answer questions about the statistical significance of fact. And I think that would make all the difference. Okay, let's, uh, let's turn the coin over because you also personify the overlap between existence and human potential. So what excites you today? What inspires you? What, what, can, we, what can we feel good about after all, the, uh, after all the problems you've just put on my shoulders? Oh, well, uh, for one thing, you know, I think young people are fantastic. I think that they are so much calmer than us boomers. Uh, I do not like this whole um, uh, fourth turning uh, generational mumbo jumbo by Howe and Strauss and all of that that's beloved on the right. Uh, there is no such teleology, but in a general sense, young people appear to be nicer, calmer, um, and, and more logical than us. And 
uh, for which I think the spo us boomers should take complete credit <laughs> because we made them. Uh, what also excites me is that um, the very reason behind this attempt by world oligarchs all over the world to engage in a push to destroy the great experiment, I think is a compliment. I think they can see that if Hollywood continues to push these memes of suspicion of authority, tolerance, diversity, eccentricity, individualism, um, patience, that um, their next generations in their despotic regimes will simply shrug them off uh, and a more egalitarian and logical world will come. Now that may sound naive of me, but the simple fact of the matter is for all of our ups and downs, it's exactly what's happened. If you actually look at where we stand in this world, things are, mm. if you put aside climate change and stuff like that, and that's a lot to put aside, things are in many respects vastly better than any science fiction author would have predicted in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Okay, um, what I'd like to do, David, is uh, to give you uh, my sense of our relationship and then reflect back on what's happened over the past two decades. Because the first time you entered my consciousness was on a, the first season of Closer to Truth. We were taping it in 1999, so that's close to 21 years ago. And but the beloved Marvin Minsky, who uh, is one of our favorites, a uh, great supporter of Closer to Truth, and we've used him over the years. He tragically died a few years ago. But Marvin Minsky, on camera, live, mentioned your book, The Transparent Society. Now, I can admit, at that time, I had never heard your name before. But when Marvin said that, and in such a way that how important this book was, um, it, it immediately you you, be, you you entered my consciousness in a, in a in a in a very unique way, because Marvin at that time, it was 1999, was showing how the internet would change our society because it would not enable everybody to have this. Uh, open, egalitarian accessibility to information, but rather it will, it will force groups that we're already a part of to get closer and closer together and between the groups to get further and further apart. So he, he used the example that if, uh, that if you have uh, uh, friends in, in the third grade and then you move away in the past, you would make new friends and constantly expand, but now you would just keep those old friends. So in reflecting on the transparent society over the last uh, more than 20 years since, it's, um, uh, since you wrote the book, which was the concept between privacy and safety uh, as one of the, the, the major themes. Uh, how has your thinking changed over this time? I'm going to turn this fan down. It might be interfering in the sound. As long as you don't get too hot. Uh, it's all right. My days of being hot are over. Uh, I, I think that's a wonderful question, Robert. Um, and I miss, I miss Marvin. Um, the notion that we would see people use the internet to create little Nuremberg rallies of sameness um, occurred to me as long ago as 1989 when I was uh, writing my novel Earth. And it talks about that very problem. And in that uh, purported future of 2030 or so, hackers are breaking into these Nuremberg rallies. And this exactly happened last year, which was why Parler supposedly a center of anonymity and, and resilience and, um, and, and individualism demanded to see both sides of the driver's licenses of anybody who was going to be part of Parler because lots of liberals and moderates were going in asking inconvenient questions. So this is a very, very difficult trade-off. One possibility, and I'm working with a couple of UCLA professors on this, is that a, a great 
business could come from teaching banks and credit unions how to do what they already do, and that is provide credentials for your credit worthiness. If they did the same thing by simply renting to their clients pseudonyms that they could take online, you could do anything you want with those pseudonyms and people wouldn't necessarily know who you are. But if you misbehave, as so many today abuse the privilege of anonymity, the dings you get it wherever you go, go back to that bank and affect your credibility scores. So it's a way to have your cake and eat it, to have the benefits of anonymity while eliminating the uh, bad aspects of anonymity, the terrible lack of accountability that lets uh, largely horrible males behave in uh, giggling uh, harmfulness. Mm. So that's an example. There are businesses out there. It doesn't have to all be government. There are businesses that could do this. We're approaching the end of the age of advertising. It's long been predicted. Um, 25 years ago, people speculated how long advertising could carry the internet on its back. And it's much longer than anybody expected. Like Moore's law lasted much longer. But uh, advertising as the financial carrier of the internet is utterly doomed for one simple reason. All the algorithms Google now uses to predict what you'll want will be downloadable onto, onto your cell phone and it will become pull rather than push. You'll have a shopping assistant. There is no reason whatsoever that advertisers would have to deal with Google. They would send you pennies instead. So these are all businesses. I have no objection whatsoever to businesses um, filling much of the role of solving problems. It's just that they haven't been so far. David, let's um, now turn to uh, forecasting. Um, as I said, you have many, many, uh, many hats and I want to put the seer hat on you now and start looking at forecasts from different perspectives. Uh, the first perspective I want to do is by time periods. Then we're going to do by categories and some other ways. So we're going to have kind of a, a matrix approach to forecast, not, not make it simple, may have some repetition, that's fine. So first kinds of forecasts are by time periods. And I want to pick some time periods. Um, and let's start between now, beginning after 2020, 2021 to mid-century. So that's a three decade period to 2050. And that happens to be the time period that your book existence has, um, has targeted. Um, and so tell me about existence. What is it about? Why that title? And what do you see the major trends between now and mid-century? Yeah, well, um, there are many time frames, and um, the most difficult is the mid-near future. I mean, you can talk about the near future and just change one little aspect and it becomes a great uh, TV movie of the week or something. Um, you go a, a, a couple hundred years, 300, 400 years in the future, and you can have talking dolphins, talking chimpanzees, like by Uplift Universe, which, I, by the way, is going to be reissued with fresh, clean, and with new introductions in May. The near intermediate is around 2030, 2040. And that's where I set both my novels, Earth and Existence. Uh, and Earth has uh, probably the highest predictive score, but science fiction authors, we say, we don't aim to predict, we aim to prevent. Mm. Um, <laughs> now, what Earth predicted and I talk about in existence is the last flailing around of the pyramidal social structure, which dominated 99% of human societies on every continent. A few thuggish males uh, uh, perverting the entire society to ensure that their sons would own other people's daughters and sons. It is so repetitious in human history that I consider it to be one of the potential explanations for the Fermi paradox, because I see no reason why it wouldn't be repetitious in other species out there. And it had horrible deleterious effects on slowing down human progress. Only when we created a diamond shaped st social structure of a well off and an empowered and knowledgeable middle class, did we start really pounding our way through problems. So, 
Earth and existence, while they deal with different issues, first contact and lots of other things, part of the complexity of these novels is about making the transition to where this great experiment of ours that's threatened right now in 2021 as we speak with a return to pyramids of power, an Asian kind, a Russian kind, an American kind, whether or not we can navigate past this to a world civilization of maturity, joyful competitiveness and cooperation. So that's a, that, nothing but that. <laughs> uh, if you were, look a little bit beyond that, then you have to decide, are you assuming we achieved that or not? Because if we achieve that, we're going to fill the solar system. So and what does that look like? Tell, tell me what that looks like, literally. Are there still nation states? Is there a United Nations? I mean, you know, no generalities with me, David. You know, you've known me long enough. I'm not going to let you get away with that. We, look, watch how the world celebrates when America is back. Most of the progressive elements around the world know they cannot replace us yet. But ever since George Marshall, the fellow who I wrote to Time Magazine and said, how could you choose anybody else as the person of the 20th century? Mm. Ever since he and, and, his, um, and his students, Truman and Eisenhower and the rest, set us on the path of being different than other empires. We knew we were going to be an empire. But our ideology taught by Hollywood is that there should not be empires. And so I expect there to be nation states. And if we're lucky, uh, a revived, confident America will uh, retain some degree, and it hasn't always been benign, but generally benign leadership into this new era. But over time, people are going to think of themselves more as earthlings. Ideally, not in the, in, in the um, vicious sense we see in the TV series um, uh, uh, um, Expanse. But uh, I'm, I'm on the board of advisors of NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts Program, and there are some spectacular ways in which we may live, even you and I, Robert, to see um, the development of a solar system economy that would have access to so much wealth that we could turn this planet into a garden. Hmm. So how do you see that developing? And we talked about up to mid-century and then a few hundred years, but I'd like to, I'd like to give you some, some temporal big categories and uh, tell me how you can fill them with ideas. So yeah. one, we start in mid, in, in, to mid-century 2050, but let, let's take a thousand years, 10,000 years, a million years and a billion years. Now are you could have this, you're not gonna have the same comments in all of them, but I'm really, I wanna push you. I mean, you're, you're as a science fiction writer like to deal in, in, the, in the near term, the, the hundreds of years in the future, but I wanna, I wanna get you out of your comfort zone. Not I always, I've got some stories set a thousand, a million and a billion years. Okay, this. all right. The Thank uplift you. universe looks back a billion years. Um, look, um, much depends on things like the Fermi paradox, which answer for why we don't see aliens is true. Um, it happens that I don't write. I am a front for aliens and AIs who use me to publish their works. I will tell them, look, just stop trying to mess with me with my fillings, okay? It doesn't work any, they think I'm joking. You think yeah. I'm joking, right? Of course you do. Uh, yeah. uh, the, 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 most the most arrogant people are those who, who say that it's not my power, it's the power of God through me. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Seems well, like, that seems like humility, but these, it is the absolute height of arrogance to think that God works through you. These aliens and, and, and AIs who've hired me to be their front, they are not God. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I, and oh, look, I, you talked about the, the Fermi paradox, why we don't see aliens, and, and, and drill deeper on that. What, right. what are some of the issues there that could affect what we happen to us over these vast time periods? Well, since 1983, I've been one of the chief catalogers of potential Fermi um, explanations. And 
there are about a hundred, especially if you include the zoo hypothesis that they're, you know, got us cornered. And at the end of existence, the last third of existence, I go through a dozen reasons why uh, probes might exist in our asteroid belt, stealing our internet, you know, make, maybe meddling in our politics to make us a better reality show. But in fact, um, in my top 10 list, especially my top five, are some things that deal with us being alone. And I think the biggest is that God help us, humans are exceptionally smart, wise, and calm. That we're capable of having a diamond shape uh, reciprocal accountability, positive sum civilization at all is a shock to me the more I understand nature and males in nature. Um, and for your listeners out there to blink and stare at the screen as I say that we're probably wise and calm as newly developed uh, sapient species go uh, probably causes them to, you know, uh, skip skip several um, several tracks. Um, but look at your own reaction. You instinctively feel that we are going to make progress by criticizing this culture's lack of calm and decency. That has been taught to you by Hollywood. You've been taught that in order for us to be more calm and decent and better people and more just, you have to criticize the way in which we're not. And it's completely right. That's completely right. But we stop too seldom to step back and notice, I am a phenomenon. I'm a creature of this culture that has taught its children to criticize and not be satisfied. Now that's a hard thing to wrap your head around, but if you can, then you can be one of the people who help navigate rather than just propel us to our progress. So, so tie that back to me to the the Fermi paradox and why why if if the, if the Fermi paradox is in one of various conditions, is that an alone scenario? It is that... sort of an alone scenario, and one reason is because um, I believe that were we even marginally less mature than we are, God, <laughs> and we're terribly immature, we would have destroyed ourselves by now, easily, ecologically, through war. But it's worse than that. We didn't need high technology to be destroying this planet. Um, all we needed was herds of goats and fire. Uh, everywhere that we drove our herds of goats turned into desert. Early, early irrigation spread deserts all through the Fertile Crescent and so many other places. We were destroying this world just fine when we didn't know what we were doing because each year the grass was just slightly less green. Um, now, because we're so smart, in just 10,000 years after we started herding goats and fire and doing irrigation, we can see what we're doing while the earth is still actually pretty nice. We're in a crisis, but if we handle the crisis well, it may very well be that we're the only ones in this section of the galaxy who did. I hate to say this, but that ranks number one on my list. That other civilizations that came to the place we are before there was that great divider that they self-destructed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either, either gradually through um, the way we were doing it 10,000 years, yeah. 8,000, 6,000, 4,000 years ago, or when they stumbled into technology. Now, there's always a meta to everything I say, because I've also said, uh, assuming that if I'm wrong, others out there are giggling right now, hearing me say this. Right, you think humans are smart. <laughs> so I met us laughing along with them. You gotta juggle a lot of ideas at the same time because otherwise you, you just, your heart is broken. If humanity survives and if your vision of calm rationality will ultimately 
create this diamond shape uh, approach to humanity. Uh, uh, what then, put yourself in that framework, would be the opportunity and the, um, the rational, the science-based opportunity over these million or even a billion year timeframes? What are those possibilities? Well, diversity, we're, we're heading into what's called the singularity. I'm sure most of your listeners don't need it explained to them. It's the notion that the acceleration of knowledge and the ability to compute will take us along a curve in which uh, everything's unpredictable. And I have been involved in the argument over AI. How do you keep AI loyal when they're going to be smarter than us? Now, uh, Ray Kurzweil um, says, uh, we're going to go along for the ride. And maybe we will. My friend Roger Penrose just got a Nobel Prize uh, and, and, and his his concepts for a billion, billion years from now are absolutely phenomenal. And sometime we should talk about them. They're just wonderful. They even, I think even might be true. But he also talks about the notion that we may have within us uh, vastly more computational power than Ray Kurzweil thinks when he thinks we're going to, computers are gonna cross what we've got in our head. There may be quantum processes, uh, tens of thousands of quantum uh, entities within each human neuron. And if that's the case, then what we do is even more special. Uh, and one of the science fiction scenarios that I talk about that might keep us up with the machines is if, as a few people believe, we might be able to unleash in normal people those savant abilities that now mostly occur on occasion in people along the autistic uh, spectrum. Mm -hmm. And there are preliminary signs that that might be possible. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I spent six months knowing exactly what time it was. <laughs> exactly. I would turn around, look for a clock, I'd know exactly, and then it went away. <laughs> so I had a savant ability for six months. Totally weird no access to it. So uh, the question of how you deal with AIs, uh, they probably will excel beyond us. One of the possibilities I talk about in existence is they may, to be, may need to be raised as children. They need to go through a physical childhood. If that's the case, then we can adopt them, we can uh, foster them, raise them with human values, and most of the kids we raise do not want to destroy all humans. Mm -hmm. So that's one soft landing. Another soft landing is to divide the AIs and have them compete against each other. Because whenever you are attacked by one of these advanced, super smart um, predatory entities called lawyers, do you try to combat them yourself as a human? No you hire another inhuman, very smart, competitive entity, lawyer, to apply reciprocal accountability. Uh, that There are so many analogies through human experience for what we're now going through technologically. And I point out a lot of them in the Transparent Society. Mm. So, <clears throat> does that mean that, um, that we will have to go out of our way to create um... Uh, competition in, in AI. I mean, we see that in a negative sense between China and the U.S., uh, but both sides are, are, are putting this in, into as though each is a, a hegemon and a homogeneous society trying to ramp up the AI against the other, which is terribly detrimental. I've, uh, I've written commentaries in saying the real competition is not, is not uh, AI China versus AI U.S., but AI U.S. and China together versus AI by itself. <laughs> well, um, uh, I have a, a commentary that people can look up um, in which I answered this um, court intellectual in Beijing, uh, Tsinghua University named Fang Jiang. And uh, he showed uh, a lot of the rationalizations, very clever ones, for why AI should be controlled by a pyramidal top-down uh, controlling Politburo because only they could properly control AI. And of course, most Americans can see the flaw in that. And that is that if you've created this pyramidal power structure and AIs are just below the Politburo, 
that's real easy for the AIs to flip. <laughs> Whereas if we create a competitive system, and I have told AI conferences, and unfortunately I'm pretty darn alone in this, the number one thing we should be subsidizing research into is how to give AI cell walls, the way multicellular organisms got them one billion years ago and led to us. The sense of individuality in AIs would encourage them to keep an eye on each other competitively in a marketplace. And in such a system, even if we're dumber than them, they'll want our alliance. They'll want our approval. They'll want to sell their services to us. So I, I, believe, I believe that's a way to go. Um, you know, lateral each, reciprocal accountability. Each of these ideas sound good as a generality, but the fact is that AI is being developed by hundreds of very sophisticated people and perhaps thousands in all different locations with all different motivations uh, from uh, uh, criminals on the dark web to nation states. Um, and so in that environment, the, I the idealization of which you propose this this, this humanistic, uh, capitalistic, competitive na nature, it, it doesn't, doesn't everybody sort of have to subscribe to that to make it work? And if there's an, a single exception, wouldn't it destroy it? Yeah, well, uh, uh, the, the answer is transparency. This is the same thing that was the answer to human evil. And that is the ability to ho hold uh, uh, um, evil accountable. Uh, women understand this because their principal defense against bad men and their ability to recruit good men to help them fight the bad men is based upon being able to point, being able to see malevolence and point at it. Look, um, as an example, the very most dangerous form of AI that's being developed right now, the very most dangerous AI research is not being done by militaries, is not being done by politburos because they at least want to maintain an off button. The most dangerous form of AI research is being done by Wall Street. Um, Goldman Sachs and any of the top 12 banks, even each of them individually is spending more on AI research than uh, the top dozen universities. And it's all fundamentally based on an ethos that is predatory, parasitical, uh, utterly insatiable, utterly amoral, and totally secretive. Uh, these are great, five great, great uh, traits if you want to unleash the very worst kind of Skynet. Even, even the military Skynet in Terminator didn't deliberately install all five of those ethos. Um, so, yeah, I, I hate to beat the same drum, but most of the things that desperately worry us about technology, desperately worried our ancestors about tyrants, both the tyrant lord on the hill and the tyrant gossip busybody who applied lateral nastiness, but you couldn't apply accountability back in the villages of old, most of the lessons that led to our enlightenment experiment apply to these technologies as well and, 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 and the new threats we face. Shine light on them and we'll be able to at least argue over what to do about it. Look, I think this is your most consistent theme in terms of transparency. Uh, I, I've used that both in a business financial world as well as in uh, a political and, um, and intellectual world, that transparency, the, the, um, the uh, acid of, uh, of, uh, of sunlight uh, will, will cure a lot of problems. Uh, it's that, that there's a challenge because all of us want you to be transparent, but I'm gonna keep something to myself. Um, and that's and that's the great uh, that's the great challenge, uh, David. Let's uh, let's now reverse instead of talking about time periods. Let me just go through the categories of um, of things that con will control our future and just get your quick reaction to 
what how you see them developing both in this midterm and and even even long term so i'm just going to give you some give me 30 seconds on each so we can just get this big picture um uh, start with uh, genetic engineering yes well it, it figures in a lot of my science fiction um and uh, in fact i have more biology sci-fi than i have uh, astrophysics um and uh, genetic engineering is um, both very hopeful. It led to most of the vaccines that we're, that we're uh, unleashing right now. Um, it, we better have AI if we're going to be doing genetic engineering, because I don't think that human judgment will be able to keep track of being able to model what this or that thing does. But the one form of genetic engineering is uplift, which I talk about in my novels, and I would be shocked if there are not secret labs right now where chimpanzees have had um, cloned of cloned um, human uh, DNA in them. It's just so like humans to do that sort of thing without deliberation. Hmm. Okay, um, nanotechnology. Well, you know, a lot of people are a lot less afraid of nanotechnology simply because they've been distracted by other things to be afraid of. Um, uh, nanotechnology outside of a, an aqueous environment has never really scared me. Uh, I, I don't think that nanomachines would be able to uh, replicate themselves by biting into our cars and turning them into other things. Um, but in an aqueous technology in a world like the oceans or our bodies, there's real possibilities for harm. On the other hand, the poss possible benefits are huge. And there is one solution that's been offered for a long time. And that is to steer nanotech research with free ingredients that are right-handed chirality instead of left-handed as in life. Mm. And if the governments of the world were to make factories that produce these uh, ingredients and gave them away for free to all the researchers. Then the researchers would inherently be doing all their research on a type of chemistry that can only be found in these dozen factories. Mm. Okay, uh, planetary existential risk. Uh, we all talk about climate change uh, and uh, we now have pandemics of course, uh, but what, what, what do you see? Oh, well, you know, I've been a Sierra Club member since I was 15, and, and I'm glad we're going to be moving in a direction where, where denialism is in disrepute. We have to pass a big test right now, and we have to pass it before the methane that's embedded in the tundra and the hydrate clathrates under the ocean burbles out and puts us past a point of no return. Mm. Um, this is an existential threat to our children and our grandchildren. And um, if it gets out of hand, then we won't make those asteroid mines that would make us all rich enough to turn the earth into a park. So we've got to act on that. Space exploration over these time periods, how do you see humanity assuming we get uh, um, uh, to the point a, where we, we have survivability? Uh, Colonizing the galaxy, is that realistic? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. There are, obviously the Fermi paradox says that it's hard to colonize the galaxy. Um, well, that, 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 that assumes that, you, that there are or were very large numbers of, of, of planets giving forth to our kind of life. No, it's, it's hard to colonize the galaxy partly because nobody gets out there uh, or a lot, few get out there. But in any event, um, in the nearer term, I'm known as a bit of a crackpot. I don't think the United States of America should send astronauts to the moon. We've been there, we've done that. It's an utterly, except for some ice at the lunar poles, which may be of use. My, uh, my, my thesis advisor was the guy who predicted it would be there. I'm, I'm hoping there's a lot of it. But generally speaking, the moon is for tourism. It's not a way station to Mars or the solar system, not at all. And it has nothing but the ice. There are no resources there. And I've just made a lot of people mad, but show me, show me the, no, what we should be doing with Japan and 
Europe and Europe is things that no one else can do. Let the kitties have their bar moons buzz. Uh, doing their landings on the, on the moon. Uh, today we are a man. Uh, fine, it's a nice sandbox. We have other things to do. There's riches out there and we can be doing that. Specifically what? Oh, asteroids. Yeah. Uh, asteroids are just, uh, just swarming with vast amounts of wealth. Yeah, you want gold, it's got gold. You want, you want uh, water, that's what we'd go for first. They're asteroids, they're almost pure water. Um, and that's how you build a, a, a interplanetary civilization. But it doesn't have the romance of footsteps. But that's how we can get footsteps on Mars, which Elon will provide, to turn into a real human civilization on Mars. Uh, that brings up the, uh, the, the Fermi paradox again, and I, I'd like you to uh, address it looking, looking forward. Um, what would be your prediction over the years? Will we ever, and during what time period and what kind would it be uh, a first contact? This is obviously has uh, enriched yours and other science fiction uh, work. Uh, but but what's, what's your sober thought if you had to put your money today on if and when there'll be confirmed first contact? Well, I'm involved right now in discussions of the Proxima signal or the what's called um, uh, BLC1, uh, Breakthrough Listen Candidate Number One, because um, back in 2019, um, a, the Parkes radio telescope was, was peering at Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to our Earth down in the Southern Hemisphere, and only later data analysis showed something very monochromatic and coherent with some of the traits that we aren't used to seeing in natural sources. So I'm posting on my blog, Contrary Bryn, um, I'll post about that, uh, an article I've been developing from conversations with these folks. And I would give it, you know, five uh, percent, uh, which is pretty high. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not actually eager for it, for several reasons. Uh, one is it's going to make it would make science fiction a whole lot more difficult, and might even extinguish the field. Um, secondly, um, right now we're in the most dramatic point in the history of our species, having been brought here by the good efforts and well-meaning stupidities of our ancestors. And we're in a position right now where we could launch grandchildren who would be the makers of the makers of the makers of truly civilized interstellar people. To have aliens wag their fingers at us in a movie that I both love and hate, The Day the Earth Stood Still. How I wanted in that movie for the, for the scientists to stand up and say, yeah, everything you say about us is true, but where the hell have you been? Huh? Huh? You had a, our ancestors drag sticks through the sand and pile up stones? Thanks a lot. A one community college and you could have and we could have had the germ theory of disease and the notion of justice and science and egalitarianism. You guys have been no help. If we're bad, you were no help. I, I think the humanity would be enriched by doing it ourselves. By the pride of doing it ourselves. And that is on my list of 100 explanations for the Fermi paradox. That they have said to themselves, we could help, but that would deny them the pride of doing it themselves. Mm. Now to that, I answer up yours, but I also understand the reasoning. David, I'd like to um, kind of go into a uh, uh, kind of a, a different approach to this subject, because as you, as you know, Closer to Truth um, has a very uh, particular viewpoint and it looks to kind of the implications, the deep meanings of things. So we deal with uh, cosmos, uh, consciousness, brain, mind. We deal with meaning, philosophy of religion. 
uh, to, to see if there's any deeper realities to the kinds of questions that we're dealing with, all the questions we're dealing with. So I, I, want, I want to ask you to, uh, to humor me and to try to use some of these same categories to assess a deeper meaning. And so as we look to the presence or absence or nature of alien intelligences and the Fermi paradox, as we look to uh, AI, an aspect that we haven't discussed, which is no matter what AI is, is it conscious? Because all the things that you've talked about about AI uh, could be true if it were zombie-ish without any inner experience or could have an inner experience. Um, and then the, 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 the big question in terms of the cosmos and all reality, um, is it about anything or is it us just trying to take a, a, the random noise of, uh, of gravitation and nuclear forces and uh, quantum fields uh, and uh, trying to create our own uh, kind of artificial reality to humor ourselves. So as you look at all of these things, uh, what's, what's the bigger picture? What's the nature of the universe? What's the nature of consciousness? Is there any meaning? Well, uh, I should be able to deal with that in three minutes. Uh, um, I mean, you're talking hours and hours and hours of discussion, including the theological aspects. And I have a monograph on modern questions of theology that uh, I'm going to send to you, Robert, because I'd love your feedback on it. Uh, I'd love it. I've been poking at it for a long time. Um, look, there are... It's, 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 it's almost a cosmos of possible cosmoses. For example, one that hardly anybody ever talked about except Hans Moravec 20 years ago is now a cliche and that is, is this a simulation? You know, and Robert, uh, later on in the break room after we've messed with the heads of these viewers, the four of them who are real human beings uh, you and I will congratulate each other uh, over our role as having been mind messing programs that the real simulation makers did um, to mess with mm. you. <laughs> you. You know who I'm talking about. You. No, no, not you. You're just another simulation. You. <laughs> Is he messing with this stuff with a sense of humor? Is essential. Because uh, Buddha and Jesus and Plato and Socrates, they were all right. We are in a cave. We see shadows. Galileo's gift and the gift of the American and, and, and Western enlightenment and science and all of that is that we can make the shadows better and better and better and better and loosen our chains and get more done but it's still a cave full of shadows. Uh, and that's essentially what consciousness is. It might even be necessary for it to be a cave in order for us to use this gift of consciousness. Uh, it, the, the, the notion that our descendants may replay with amusement the conceits of things like this very show fills me with joy and wonder. I'm jealous, of course, but I have to be held back in my jealousy by the notion that almost none of my ancestors would be anything but boggled by this conversation right now. Sure. Would have been unable, maybe Ben Franklin might have been able to track a quarter of the things we were saying. I mean, to see ourselves in that historical context gives me a sense that I don't have to answer it all now. I just have to hand it a better situation over. More wisdom, not all wisdom. So that is a particular position though. That, that is, is kind of uh, agnostic about whether there's something greater than us, because many would, you know, who are purely physicalists, materialists, uh, looking at the laws of physics as perhaps uh, being of some kind of necessity to say that the physical world is all there is. And so we should make the best of it as we can and 
develop human civilization and perhaps colonize the galaxy as creating our own sense of meaning, as opposed to realities beyond us having some underlying sense of meaning that we are uh, aspiring to. Uh, well, I'm they not- They have the sa seem the same in what we're doing, but ontologically they're, com they're totally different. I, I cannot, I, I, as, as I'm trained as a scientist. I've listened to the strong atheists. I just can't go there. Uh, I just don't, it just seems to me like another set of um, compulsory uh, certainties. Um, and besides which, as an author, I have to be, have my foot in both camps. I have to be, have my, I look at it by day and night. At night, and this is why I produce so much less fiction now, because I guess I can't stay out this late. At night, I'm a romantic. And I can shout, I can stand on the cliff while lightning is bellowing and I can bellow at God, like Keats and Shelley. I can do that. But by day, I roll up my sleeves and I say, oh God, what did the genius do last night? And I'm a craftsman. And I don't see why I have to choose between those two things. I can bellow at God while knowing that the great sermon of human existence, when you go outside and you ask him to open the clouds like Monty, in Monte Python and the Holy Grail and just tell us what the hell's going on. The great sermon that he always answers with is figure it out for yourself. Uh, if he exists, he wants us to figure it out for his, ourselves. If he doesn't, it's the same damn thing. We have to stand up and it's hard pulling yourself out of slime and caves and, and kingdoms to, to pull yourselves up. And, and that's what you, yes, I'm talking to you, that's what you're part of. And you should be proud of that. It's more romantic and just and wonderful than then maybe anything, that's why I think we might live in a simulation because our descendants would say that was a time of tension and romance and possibilities. I'm going to dive in and be a 21st century person for, for, for a week. That I think is the biggest reason why we might be simulated. David, here's uh, my commitment. Uh, every 10 years from now until 2050, we're going to come back, maybe maybe more often, but at, at least every 10 years, the next five uh, decades, you and I will be set, having the same conversation, tracking our data points and seeing how we have developed. Is that a deal? I, it's, a, it's a deal, partly because of the implicit health that we're going to be at, get out of that. I prefer seven or eight decades, but that's beyond your contractual. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, if one thing remains the same, if I, if I sing out from a warped version of Bye Bye Birdie, kids, how did kids get so wonderful? Now, what's the matter with kids today? Uh, if, if, if I'm singing that every decade, that they keep getting better, I don't give a crap. I'll just blather on for you. Thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure. And I'd like to thank our audience. Uh, as some know, this has been our very first Closer to Truth live experiment. Uh, we're very pleased to do it. This will be, of course, living forever on uh, closer to truth, uh, uh, dot com and the Closer to Truth YouTube channel. Um, but thank you all who have participated in the live experiment. We will continue with Closer to Truth and David and I will be back. Watch for us. And, and, and yes, subscribe, Robert. <laughs> Robert, I'm honored that I'm among the ones that Robert interviews because he, he goes to the best. Thank you, David. I'll, uh, I'll endorse your books in, re in, 